you guys video from.
Let's give them a round of applause. I thank you, Leah, for your servant attitude to this congregation, to this body. Thank you for the songs that you bring to us. Songs we can wake up in the night and sing. Amen. Songs that put Christ at the focal point of worship. Amen. I love that. Keep Jesus at the center, and you do a wonderful job. All of you, I thank God for you. The young man who is speaking today needs no introduction. He's one of ours. He's been with us for some time. Excellent preacher of the Word of God. Comes from a family of preachers. <laughs> That's uh, very exciting. And I am so honored to have him come and spend time with us because it has been my prayer through the years that uh, one of these days, by God's grace, I'm going to have to move over. I'm not moving over now. No, no, don't say goody, goody. It's time for you to move. Don't say that yet. But one of these days, I'm going to have to move over. I, I received an invitation from, uh, I haven't worked out the final details, and I want the choir to hear this because they invited me to come to Mississippi, to my home church. It's a passion, it's a dream that I have. I really wish I could take the choir, I wish I could take Southern Heights Baptist to go to Mount Moriah Missionary Baptist Church and sing as I try to preach to the place where God spoke to my heart and I came forward and gave my life to Jesus Christ. I want to see that happen, but the one who's going to speak to us this morning, Reverend Curtis Love is his name, and he's a compassionate man. He loves people. He's outgoing. He's friendly. He's gregarious. You, you know what I mean? All of those terms that they give to those people who kind of make their way in society. <laughs> And I'm honored to have him to come. His name is Reverend Curtis Love. And the next voice you'll hear will be his. Good morning. It is, <clears throat> first of all, an, an honor to be introduced by such a man as Pastor Aiden, 46 years plus of ministry in this community is nothing to sneeze at. <laughs> it is the, a great testament to what God can do in the life of those who commit themselves to him. I thank Pastor Aiden for his, his ministry and how it has been a great example for those of us who are coming behind him. And one of the greatest things about Pastor Aiden's ministry is that it teaches the young man today that you can do ministry. And you can worship God and the gifts that he's given you Amen. and be a man of integrity. Amen. So I thank Pastor Aiden for that. I, I know um, Sister Maria gave an opportunity for people to stand and address uh, first time visitors. Um, my buddy didn't get up, so I'm gonna put I'm gonna put put him on the spot right now. <laughs> you don't have to get up. I'll introduce you. <laughs> this is uh, this brother who's with us today. His name is Ron Shavers. I um, I met Ron several years back. He knocked on our door one morning uh, doing the census, and and that's how we met. And since then we have been uh, friends and. It has just been a joy to, to know him and spend time with him. And actually, a little secret I want to tell is that he actually was probably one of the most influential people in, in my life when it came time for me to decide to get a master's degree. Uh, he was at times annoying about it, <laughs> but he stayed on me. So I, I just thank God for him, but he's here this morning, and he, he, he is a resident of Winona Lake, Indiana. I'm always grateful that my wife is here with me. Um, can't say enough about her. Um, God has truly blessed me with her. But with, with, with all of that being said, let us look to the, the word of God. 
as it is seen in Psalm 6, the sixth division of the psalm. I know we read the psalm together this morning. Uh, however, I, I will read it again just so that it is fresh in our minds as we seek to hear a word from the Lord. Before we do that, let's, let's pray. Father God, Lord, your word is magnificent. It is, Lord, a treasure. We are blessed by it. We are encouraged by it. We are We're convicted and rebuked by it. We pray, Father God, that our hearts would be open, Lord, to hear truth this morning. Whatever the distraction, whatever the... The, the past experiences in life, whatever would, would seek to distract our hearts from hearing the truth concerning Christ, Lord, may you remove it. And as always, Lord, we, my prayer is that we would hear a word from you and not a word about you from me. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 The sixth psalm is a psalm that was written by David, King David. And he writes, beginning at verse 1, O Lord, re rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death there is no remembrance of you, and Sheol, who will give you praise? I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eyes waste away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. Depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. Those were the words of King David. Uh, Psalm 6 is, the great thing about the Psalms is that it's almost as if though we get, a, we get an opportunity to look into the, the journal, <laughs> as it were, of, of King David. It, this, this Psalm reads like a, a, a journal entry that he made and so which is why he is so freely speaking of his grief and the trouble in his soul the, the it, it, he's speaking of these things freely because it, it's pretty much writing in his journal it's between him and the Lord but this Psalm um, 6 is referred to or is, is, is labeled a penitent Psalm it's, by penitent it means that it is a Psalm of repentance and so what we see here in Psalm 6 is we see a king who has been brought low by his sin. We see a king who has been gripped by the reality of his sin. And so he writes this psalm, which is why it reads the way it does, because he is broken and his countenance is low because of his sin. Now some of you would say, what, what, but what sin are we referring to? So as far as the historical context, the sin that David here is gripped by, the sin that is causing his bones to be troubled, the sin that is causing his soul to be weary, the, the sin that is, that, that is causing his eyes to waste away, is the sin he committed with the married woman Bathsheba. Some of you may know the story of David and Bathsheba. If you don't know the story of David and Bathsheba, then if you have a moment sometime today or throughout this week, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11 and familiarize yourself with the sin that David is referring to here. But for the sake of time, I will give a quick snippet or a quick trailer, as it were, of the story of David and Bathsheba, as is found in 2 Samuel chapter 11. David, during that time, was king of Israel. And during the time that, that kings were supposed to be out at battle, there came a time each year where there was the prescribed time where kings were supposed to be out fighting on behalf of their kingdoms. And during this time, when David was supposed to be at battle, he stayed home. And he sent out his troops and he stayed home. And so one night as 
he was at home, he decided to go up on the rooftop. And he, as he was walking on the rooftop, he noticed a very attractive woman who was in her nakedness bathing herself. And so David sent and inquired about who this woman was that he saw the lust in his heart moved him to not only watch her as she bathed, but to actually inquire as to who she was. So messengers came back and they said, David, the woman who you are, who you were, who you are wondering about, she is the wife of Uriah. She's a married woman, king. But the lust of his heart wasn't enough. And so he sent and he had her brought in to his, his home and he lay with her, he slept with her. And then he sent her away and even still the lust of his heart was not satisfied, and so it wasn't good enough to, do, to watch her bathe. It wasn't good enough to sleep with her. It wasn't good enough for all this. He had to go and have her husband put on the front line of the battle so he would be killed. So in essence, David sees this man's wife bathing. He inquires about her. He finds out she's married. He brings her in. He lays with a married woman, and then he has her husband killed so he can take her as his own wife. And when you hear that, how someone could do that, then it's easy for us to understand how that type of, of action, those type of actions could bring a person low, to make a person weary when they think about how in the world could I have done such a thing. A couple of things we learn from this story when you read it in 2 Samuel. Number one, David should have been at battle. He neglected his responsibilities and therefore opened the door for sin. Now, I could stand here all morning and we could, we could make a sermon just on that, just on how when as believers we are, we are commissioned to do certain things and when we busy ourselves doing things that we are not supposed to do or not doing things we are supposed to do, we find ourselves falling into sin. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Another thing that we see from the story of David, which I think is the most important thing, is that sin is a glutton. Yes. Sin is never satisfied. The moment that David saw Bathsheba from his rooftop bathing, sin became hungry, and he fed it. And you would think, okay, his lust for this married woman would have been satisfied in just bringing her in and sleeping with her, but it wasn't because sin is a glutton. It wasn't enough to just sleep with her. He had to kill her husband. He had to take her as his wife. And so understand, beloved, one thing the story of David and Bathsheba does for us is it lets us know that sin has an appetite that we can never satisfy. That's right. The moment you begin to feed it, you're going to have to keep feeding it. The moment that sin is done with one meal, it's ready for the next. It is always hungry. It is always seeking for us to feed the lust of our hearts. I mean, think about your own life. Think about sometimes you, you do something that you shouldn't do, and sin is still hungry, so you have to lie about what you did, so add that to it, and then you get mad because the person asked you about it in the first place. Sin is forever hungry. With that in mind, David pens this psalm as a plea for deliverance. And his plea for deliverance, his plea for restoration that he makes to God here in this text is it, it, while he's doing it, David understood two things. He understood, number one, the implications of the law and its punishments. David knew he was king in Israel. David knew the law of God. David knew that to transgress the law of God meant anger, it meant wrath, it meant punishment. And so as he thinks about what he did with Bathsheba, he is brought so low and so worried because he knows that he deserves the wrath and anger of God because he transgressed his law. God's standard is obedience and perfect obedience, which is why one sin kicked Adam and Eve out the garden. David knew that he had transgressed the law of God and as, we, as you read this psalm, you can see that he was, he was worried, he was, he was troubled, which is why he says, God, be gracious to me, for I am languishing. And he is languishing, beloved, because he knows what he deserves from God. God's law, when it is transgressed, brings about death and sin and wrath and all of these things. 
Again, David was king in Israel. He knew the history of his people. He knew how every single moment that God lashed out against the people in Israel, it was because of they had transgressed his law. God is not a moody God. He doesn't get in a place where he feels like, I just feel like lashing out against people today. His law was transgressed, and every transgression, the scripture teaches us, received its just retribution. So David knew, and he knew not only did he, did, did, did he deserve the wrath of God, he deserved God's anger, but that God was justified in, in doing that. Which is why he says, O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. He says, you, you have the right to discipline me. You have the right to rebuke me, but in doing so, please be gracious to me. But there was more that David understood. He, 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 not only did he understand the law of God and its punishments, but David also understood the implications found in the covenant promises that God has made in their benefits. The plea for restoration was not unfounded. It was, it was not based on an assumption. Rather, it was based on clear and present evidences that God had promised something. He had made a promise. And yet with this being true, David could only go to God and make his request inside the context of the covenant promise that God had made, inside the boundaries of the relationship that God had set. He was not permitted to ask or even speak to God from a place that did not involve the boundaries that God had set. The boundaries that were set by God are seen in his law and in his promises. Brothers and sisters, understand, we don't haphazardly run to God from any vantage point we want to. We approach God based upon the preset boundaries that he has given us. And so David understood that the, the promises found in the covenant did not erase the expectation that God has for us to obey him. You have this law of God. You have the punishments that come along with being uh, to transgressing that law. But yet, and then you have this promise of God. But yet, the promise does not erase God's expectation for obedience. If this were true, then there would be no need for David to write a psalm of repentance. Yes, what are you repenting for, David? If you if you are part of the promises, if the law is null and void, then why are you repenting? The law does indeed bring a knowledge of sin. We, we see this manifested by David recognizing his own sin. Yet the law, with the law comes condemnation, and this truth makes the covenant and his promises all the more glorious. For where David sinned and deserved to be crushed for his sin, he was able and permitted to tap into the grace and the mercy of God not because he simply asked or not because he felt bad about his sin, but he was able to tap into the grace and mercy of God because of God's covenant promise. We too, like David, have sinned. and All of us in this room are deserving of death. Amen. We, like David, are permitted to ask God for his mercy and his grace, yet just like David could only access this mercy and grace inside the covenant relationship and his promises, we can only access the grace and mercy of God through the same promise. This promise that, this promise that David utilizes to access the deliverance from God was and is Christ. How do we know this? Well, verse 4 makes it clear. If you ever read any commentaries or listen to people preach this psalm, they, most of the time they make much of how the first seven verses are clear that David is low, he is, he is begging and he is pleading, and then they, they make a lot of, a lot of uh, they, they put a lot of emphasis on verse 8 because in verse 8 it changes. He goes from weeping and, and being troubled and, 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 and filling up his couch with tears to verse 8. It, he, 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 he is joyous. His, he, his, his mode changes. And so when you read commentaries or listen to people preach uh, of this psalm, they find that connection and they say, okay, David went from weeping and, and moaning and pleading to rejoicing. And so then verse 8 becomes then the climax of the psalm. However, I submit this morning that the thrust, rather the impetus of this entire psalm is found in verse 4. In this verse, David provides for us the grounds by which we are delivered from our sin. I'll read it for you. He says, turn, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. Yes, 
Now, why is that so important? Well, if you understand the promise that God made to David in, in, in 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 17, I'll read it for you. It says, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I shall be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, Saul, who I put away before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So David, by saying in, in verse 4, Lord, Deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. He's using the same language that God used when he made this promise to David. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. Lord, I, I got that from you. You told me that there was coming a one whom you should be a father to, and he should be a son to you, and your steadfast love will not depart from him. So that same steadfast love, I beg you, save me for the sake of that. Verse 4 is David making the repentance plea based on the promise of the one who was coming after him. Based upon the one who shall be the son. This promise of an offspring that God made to David, does it not sound very similar to the promise that God made to Abraham? Through the, his offspring, the nations will be blessed. Yet the promise that God made to Abraham sounds very similar to the promise that God made to Adam and Eve. Their offspring would have his heel bruised but, but by the serpent, but he shall crush the head of the serpent. And all these promises sound similar because it was the same promise. It was first given to Adam and Eve. It was expounded upon to Abraham. It was clarified to David, David, and it was manifested fully when John says in his gospel, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Yes. 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 Jesus the Christ is the promise that was made to Adam and Eve. The promise that was expounded upon to Abraham, the promise that was clarified to David, the promise by which David says, save me because of the promise you made of the one who is coming to take away the sins of the world. Yes. Jesus is the embodiment of the steadfast love of God. And we know this because John says later in his gospel, in chapter 3, that the love of God is evidenced by him sending his son. So the plea that David makes is founded upon the hope and the faith in the promise that God made to send his son. And so when he pens this psalm and he, he writes about how he is languishing and he is brought low by his sin, one thing he remembers, that God made a promise. Yes, and based upon that promise, I beg you, Lord, deliver me from my sins. John says, to us, and he says to David, Jesus takes away the sins of the world. Yes. That wrath, David, that you asked God not to show you in verse one, Jesus has taken that wrath. That wrath that you didn't want, he took it. The sin that caused you to brought low, he took the punishment of that sin on himself. All of your sin, all of your mess, Jesus takes it away. All of your sin, all of my sin, Jesus takes it away. He looks back at David, he says, David, what you did with Bathsheba, Jesus takes it away. But he says, cry and be troubled and be gripped by your sin. Let the knowledge of your sin move you to, to tears and, and, a, and let it cause your soul to languish. Be all those things. Be troubled. Yet know that God is saying my steadfast love is in my son. And when you are in Christ, there is deliverance. Yes. This is why we have confidence in Christ, because he is the one that God promised to send. 
And not only did he send him, but he is the one God promised to take away the sins of his people. Though David was on the other side of the coming of the promise, meaning he lived before Christ took on flesh. And though we are on this side of the promise, meaning we are living now after Christ has come in the flesh, and all of us on either side of the promise can find deliverance from sin in Christ. Whether it was before the incarnation or after the incarnation, the promise is the same. Jesus is that promise. Yet there is one more nugget in this text that I believe is, is so, so beautiful and, and, and it shares up our confidence in Jesus. And that is, in the promised one, in Christ, God hears us. He accepts our prayers. It's not what the, David said. He said, depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer." In Christ, God hears us. Let our minds stay there for a moment. God hears us. He accepts us. In Christ, we have an audience with God. And though he may allow us to languish for a little while, and though he may allow us to cry a little bit, and though he may allow us to be troubled for a moment, he hears us and he accepts us. What confidence does this give us in the midst of our troubles? in the moments of our regrets, in the moments of our failures, knowing that the great God on heaven, as his ear, is never deaf. In Christ, he accepts us for, they say, God is like a divine answer machine. It may seem like the phone is not picked up when you call, but the message was left. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He hears us. David prayed based on the coming of the promise of, of Christ. We pray based on the fact that Christ has come and his work is completed. And in both prayers, based on the same promise, God hears you. When you are in the moment of trouble, when your soul is weary, when, when your bones ache, when you feel like you're going to burst, if things get any worse, understand and know that God hears you. Yes, sir. You don't have to try to do things to turn on God's hearing aid. You don't say, well, Lord, I've, I've tried this. I've tried to fast a little bit. I've tried to, to read my Bible more. No, in the midst of your troubles, if you are in Christ, God hears you. If it pray based on the coming promise of Christ, we pray on the fact that Christ has come. Only in the context of Christ does God hear us. And this is a confidence that we take advantage of. Those who are outside of Christ, yes, sir. they can cry all day long. But God does not hear them. That's right. That's right. Those of us who are in Christ, we cry for a moment and we already heard. God's love and deliverance is wrapped up in his son. Yes, sir. His promise makes David cry out for God to deliver him. And, and, and here's the beauty of it. David does not cry out and ask God to remove his weariness. He does not cry out and ask God to remove his soul being troubled. He is not asking God to deliver his eyes from wasting away. He is asking deliverance from his sin. Everything else is just a symptom of his sin. Brothers and sisters, you can go to the store and buy a cough suppressant when you have the flu. And though it may suppress your cough, you still will have the flu. The aim in healing is to mend the problem, not the symptoms. David is saying to us, brothers and sisters, don't, don't busy your life trying to treat the symptoms. Don't busy yourself trying to figure out the surface, but in Christ, go to God and let him heal your greatest problem. And our greatest problem is sin, which is why he says now, because I've been delivered based upon your promises, all my enemies are gone away. And here's the thing, if your enemies don't go away, the main enemy has been dealt with at the cross. Our greatest foe has been defeated at the cross of Christ. And so there may be folks in your life who will try to make you think that you are weak because you know Christ or that religion is a crutch. That's fine. You know why? Because my greatest foe is gone at the cross. Christ, Christ took death for us. Go to God in Christ seeking to have the disease removed. Quit treating the symptoms. If you treat the symptoms, the symptoms may go away, but the disease remains. Yes, sir. 
David was king, yet flowing from his throne was the need for repentance. Jesus is the promised king, and flowing from his throne is pardon. Flowing from the throne of David was the need for grace, yet flowing from the throne of Christ is grace. Flowing from the throne of David was a need for forgiveness, yet flowing from the throne of Christ is forgiveness. Flowing from the throne of David was a need for the promise of God, yet flowing from the throne of Christ are all the treasures of that promise revealed. He is the king whom God said his kingdom shall reign forever. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Flowing from his throne is everything that we need for life and godliness. David understood that, which is why he used the same language that God used to say, God, this is what you said you will do. Don't go to God based upon your merits. Don't go to God based upon what you think you have accomplished. Don't go to God saying, Lord, I think it's time for you to deliver me because I, I know now that it was wrong, but you may know today that it was wrong, but tomorrow you may do it again. So don't go to God on your own accord. Go to God based upon his promise, which is Jesus. There is only one way to escape the wrath of God, and that is in Jesus. For he is the one who God promised, and he is the only grounds for our deliverance. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we are moved when we consider Jesus, the great grand glory of who he is knowing that here, even in this psalm, we see the need for repentance and the surety of the promise that is in Christ. We thank you for your son. We thank you. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. And the people of God said, Amen and praise the Lord. I want to thank you, Reverend Love, for that very appropriate message from the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Man, don't deal with the symptoms, deal with the source. Sin. This word, kata. I'm going to put it in the bulletin. I'm going to give you the places where it's used in the Old Testament, too. I'm not going to do it today, but I want you to take it home. Amen? Amen. The, the sin, that's what Jesus came to deal with. Behold the Lamb of God. He takes away the sin of the world. My heart has been moved. Amen? I want to thank Reverend Love for doing the diligent study to bring the text to us in the Word of God. Now, I don't know where you are in relationship to your relationship with Christ. Um, the Bible says that uh, as Jesus talked to Nicodemus, you must be born again. No doubt about it. Okay, how good we are. How many great things we've done. What neighborhood we live in. What my race is all about. What my ethnicity. I don't care anything about that. <laughs> but Jesus looked at this great man, Nicodemus, and said, Nicodemus, <laughs> I don't you know, compliment me about all the miracles that I've done, that you heard about me. Now, I'm not interested in that. I want you to know one thing. You must be born again. And if by chance you have not been born again, then remember that all of your good do deeds, Isaiah 64, right? Four and six, all of our righteousness are as what? Dirty, filthy rags in God's eyesight. But I'll tell you, come to the cross. I get more excited about Revelation 4 and 5 now than I was when I first started preaching in the book. Amen. <laughs> yeah. It's worthy is the Lamb. 
that was slain to receive glory and honor and thanksgiving and praise and worship. Jesus is the worthy one. But when the elder looked and said, uh, who, 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 who's going to come down here and, and take the sins and redeem the earth? And they didn't find one. And they started weeping and crying. He said, cut it out, stop it. There is one, a lion of the tribe of Judah. He has prevailed. <laughs> and he's capable of redeeming the earth back to God, which fell in Adam. Amen? Amen. That's where it fell. <laughs> fell apart in the garden. And Adam lost the authority, he lost the privilege. He lost what God gave to him originally. And Jesus came. He now buys it back. But you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust him as your Lord and as your Savior. If you haven't done that, someone will counsel with you, will help you to understand what it means to be a Christian. What it means to be saved. That's the issue that we're facing today. So if you're here and you don't know Christ as your Savior and would like to know him, as we sing this song, Behold what manner of love. And my lovely wife just walked to the piano and uh, believe me, she puts the cream on my life. I'm telling you, she, she puts the cream. <laughs> on my life. Now she's not beyond hitting the wrong key, but I just love it in my home, you know what I mean? <laughs> and and I, I have music in my life because she puts it there. And I thank God for her. Behold, what manner of love. <laughs>